Working across cultures. 4. International negotiations. Track 32. Thanks for that, Gary. And now, in this part of the day, I'd like to take a quick look at negotiating across cultures. Many people assume that international negotiations are no different to domestic ones, but that's a big mistake to make. Tactics which work well when doing business with people from your own culture do not necessarily apply internationally. For example, the idea that everyone likes to get down to business and focus on the result and get a contract drawn up. One thing to realise right from the start is that it's not only national culture that determines behaviour in negotiations. Other factors include company culture, gender, or even the level of international negotiating experience. The other point to make is that preconceptions and regional generalizations are often simply incorrect. For example, the Japanese and Koreans share some similarities but are very different in other respects. The same is true of the Italians and Spanish. It's not really possible to talk about regions in any meaningful sense. So I don't really want to talk about specific cultures, but to outline a few general principles and differences which are worth bearing in mind when getting involved in international negotiations. I'd like to look at three main areas before you break into smaller focus groups to examine some of the issues in more detail with the trainers. First of all, a major difference between cultures is the perception of the business relationship. For some cultures, business is seen in terms of a contract, objective and impersonal. The encouragement of personal relationships is generally seen as inappropriate. Emotion and sentiment can interfere with sound business decision-making, which it's felt should be rational, cool and logical. In other parts of the world, business is all about personal relationships, where business people will only do deals with people they get to know well, feel at ease with and trust. Secondly, moving on to the contract itself. For some, this is expected to be a formal, written, legal document which outlines the responsibilities, duties and deadlines of all concerned. In other cultures, it's the handshake or verbal agreement which is much more important, and in some cases it could be said that a formal contract is seen as a sign of a lack of trust or respect. A contract may also be the sign of the beginning of a business relationship rather than the final stage in the conclusion of a deal. In fact, in some cultures, the signing of the contract is a signal that negotiating for better terms can now begin. It is really an intention to do business and nothing more. Similarly, it may be claimed that because the person who signed the contract has left the company, then that contract needs to be renegotiated. This is because there is a feeling that contracts are made with individuals rather than with organisations or companies. Finally, the way that negotiations are conducted can vary. I know my colleagues spoke at length this morning about body language, eye contact and the role of silence, but it's also important to bear in mind the social aspect. Should you greet your new business partners using first names, surnames or by titles? The amount of time allowed for small talk is another issue to consider. Handshakes can be too soft and be seen as untrustworthy or too strong and therefore overly assertive. Gift-giving is expected in some countries, but viewed negatively and suspiciously in others. One last point is whether it's more usual to negotiate in teams rather than alone. Are decisions made by consensus or by one person? It may also be that the person doing the talking is not the decision-maker. So, all these things...